So, <clears throat> further dissecting John chapter 3, 14, 15, and 16. According to Greek grammar rules, John 3, 14 to 15, which comprise a complete sentence, contain a main clause, John 3, 14, and just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, and a subordinate one. John 3, 15. I should go like this. <clears throat> John 3, 16 is the same. 16b. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. This is evident in the Greek English rendering, as indicated above, and is true of John 3.16b also, as I said. The language of the New Testament, the book, the grammar book, the subjunctive mood is used in subordinate clauses such as 3.15 and 16, introduced by these three Greek words, and sometimes in clauses introduced by these other three Greek words. We'll get to these. Hina in 3, 14, 15, and 16 means that, <clears throat> in order that, so that, clauses introduced by Hina usually indicate the purpose of the action expressed in the main clause, but may indicate its result or content. Although Greek grammar rules require that the sub subordinate clause John 3, 15, and 16, rendered should not perish but should have eternal life in the NIV, begun by Kai Hina, rendered, and just as, as has its verbs in the subjunctive mood, objective possibility. But the context of the passage in John 3, 14, 15, and 16 have in view the unfailing capacity and the sovereignty of God as the power behind the purpose of the action in the main clause, which controls what happens in the subordinate clause in John 3.15 and 16, that of not perishing, that of never experiencing eternal destruction, but of having eternal life. So the subjunctive mood allows for the assumption that there is some doubt as to the outcome, depending upon ah, the reliability of the one acting for the purpose stipulated. Who do you think that is? Yourself? No. You don't give yourself eternal life. God does. So in the case of John 3, 14 to 15 and 16, the one is God. Since God is absolutely reliable, then the outcome in the subordinate clause for the believer is actual and not potential. Hence the result of never having to experience eternal perishing, but having eternal life becomes a certainty for whoever believes in the Son of Man being lifted up in an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Actually, let me just clarify that. Son of Man slash Son of God. Same person, different title. Different perspective. Point two, God must be portrayed as unfaithful and unjust if the context is to fit uncertainty in John 3, 14 to 15. As some contend, I'm answering this because I hear this all the time. God so loved the world that he gave his one only son and whosoever believes in him should never perish. Should, should. You should never perish, but you have to be faithful. But you should have eternal life. But we don't know for sure, because you've got to be faithful. See, you can't say that, because God's the one providing it, and all he asks you to do is to believe. So if the context of John three fourteen to 15 and 16 is to be changed to one of uncertain results for the believer, then a completely different picture of God must be portrayed from the one John portrays as one who lifted up the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, in an atoning sacrifice, for the sins of all mankind, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. To a God who may decide to give eternal life, and then again, he may not, for anyone who believes in him being given for them. This is a different picture of the God of the Bible, a different God who is whimsical in his giving of eternal life to some, and cruel in his holding back of eternal life from others, despite the fact that all of those in view have trusted in God's promise to provide eternal life 
for them when they believe. But some just don't get it, for no reason stipulated in this passage, and some do. That can't be. That's not the guy that, of the Bible. The Greek phrase, zoan ionian, in John 3.15 means eternal, unending godly life with God. I got a lot of people saying this. All kinds of crazy ideas what this means. Life for an age. The New American Standard Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek dictionaries, Vines Expository, and a whole bunch of other dictionaries. Many others define Ionius and its family of words, Ionion and Ioniu, just grammatical endings, depending upon the structure in the sentence, to mean without beginning or end, and eternal. This meaning is based on usage of the word over the centuries by the people to whom the ancient Koine Greek language was native. I hear this, Jehovah Witnesses, life of the ages. Plato and others are among those who use this meaning of the word Ionius in their classical Greek. Ezekiel 37, 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. That's the Ionius word. In the Hebrew, it's Olam. And I will give blessings to them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever, forevermore. Coming, tell, tell me it's just for a season or for an age. Hebrew, Olam, Ionius again. God's covenant was unilateral, so it would not be broken. Therefore, it was for all time, forevermore. None of his unilateral covenants were for a season or an age. All of his unilateral covenants were for an eternity, and God does not renege on his promises. Isn't John 3.16, John 3.14-15, isn't that unilateral? Who's going to do all the work when you trust in God to do it? He! You don't have anything to do with it. You have, you have something to do with it in terms of rewards in heaven. You can be faithful all you want, but you're not going to be perfect at it, and God's grace will get you through and get you eternal life uh, rewards, but not eternal life residency in heaven. One thing is to get there, eternal life. The other thing is get eternal life rewards. Therefore, the Hebrew word olam in the Hebrew Bible and the Greek word ionius in the Septuagint are indeed translated forevermore or eternal correctly. You can take a little more analysis of that. You can click on the more button. Words are important in the Bible. They have to be understood from the basis of language, context, and logic, and not editorialized. Since Zoan Ionian means eternal life, then me, a polity, rendered should not perish, must be equivalent but opposite, i.e. eternal perishing, eternal death, destruction. The two Greek phrases in John 3.15, me, a polity, and ech, zoan, ionian, rendered should not perish and should have eternal life, respectively, are joined by the conjunction Allah, meaning all, or but, rendered but. The Greek word Allah, rendered but, conveys a juxtaposition of equivalent opposites. Since Zoan Ionian means eternal life, more specifically an eternal unending godly life with God, then me, Apolitai, rendered should not perish, since it is joined by the junction Allah, meaning but, must be an equivalent but opposite destiny, eternal perishing, eternal death, and unending punishment and separation from God. You won't have this, but you'll have that. It's supposed to be equivalent on both sides of that equation. Buts in the middle. Point five. Eternal life once received is an intrinsic part of an individual which can never be lost. Think of that. It's not casual. Oh, you have it over there. It's in your pocket. You don't tie your shoe, you trip, and it'll fall out of your shoe. Come on. Life is an intrinsic part of an individual. That's your physical life. Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary defines life as a principle or force that is considered to underlie the distinctive quality of animate beings, an animated and shaping force or principle. Where is it located? Everywhere in your body. Hence, this principle is inherent in the individual, an intrinsic part that animates every part of one's being. Eternal life once begun in an individual, in, in an individual cannot cease to exist or exist separately from that individual being intrinsic to the individual eternal. One can never lose it. 
In the same way, eternal life, once received, becomes an intrinsic part of the individual when he believes in the Son and receives it. John 3.16, Think, listen to it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. Notice that eternal life becomes the present possession, have, right, of the individual. The moment he expresses believing in the Son being given for him, he has it. Where does he keep it? Back pocket? You'll lose it your cell phone, but it won't, you won't lose eternal life. Since eternal life once received is in you, inferring or implying, you infer an implication. So since eternal life is once received as in you, implying, P-L-Y, an intrinsic part of you for eternity, then it is not portrayed in the Bible as occupying space in a particular part of your anatomy, such that it can be removed and lost from within you and then recovered again. Furthermore, the concept of eternal life existing outside of an individual is comparing apples and oranges. The concept of something cannot be compared to the possession of it. The concept of eternal life is one which is forever, everlasting, without end, of course. But the eternal life of a particular individual, once he possesses it, it does not exist, though, until he believes, at which time the eternal life cannot go out of existence because of some infraction that may be, must be, by definition, be an intrinsic part of that individual's existence forever. An individual's eternal life cannot be measured apart from the individual any more than an individual's physical life can be measured apart from the individual's physical existence. The concept of life can be discussed in general, as some contend, but that discussion does not apply to an individual who does not yet possess physical life or eternal life. Finally, even if it could somehow be lost, as some contend, it could not be described as eternal life, but life for the duration of the time that it was an intrinsic part of that individual. You lost it in 10 years? It wasn't eternal. It was 10-year life. Thus, eternal life is in, eternally secure because it is defined as an intrinsic part of the individual for the duration of eternity. But let's do a hypothet hypothetical test of this, assuming one can lose one's salvation, repent, and recover it again. A man lost his salvation 10 years after he got saved. Later on, he repented and regained eternal life. If that were possible, and it is not, at which time he dies. Hence, it is, is the length of his eternal life one eternity plus ten years? Consider that once physical life begins, an individual exists. Once it leaves an individual, the individual ceases to exist as he originally began to exist since he is because he is destroyed. Portions of that creation may and do continue to exist, but in a totally different format, wherein the physical body is a mass of matter, dead, lifeless, no longer containing a soul or spirit, which the latter entities occupy other space. The context of the argument does not permit entering into this or any more than you can say that water can lose its oxygen, just as oxygen is intrinsic to the existence of water, and losing it would destroy the water, and all you got left is hydrogen, albeit changing it into something else which no longer functions as water. So taking away physical life from an individual destroys that individual, such that he, is no, he no longer exists as originally created. In the same way, once eternal life is received, the individual is a new creation that cannot exist without that eternal life, it being an intrinsic part of that individual forever by definition. So, it is not a viable argument to say one can lose something intrinsic as eternal life as if the individual would not be destroyed no longer in existence or go back to the point he did not have eternal life as part of his intrinsic makeup. Recall that one is forever intrinsically in Christ intrinsically part of his indestructible body at the point of faith in the gospel, sealed by the intrinsically indwelling Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. So you're going to kick God out too? So how can one lose the life in Christ apart from destroying Christ? How can the eternal body of Christ be lost? How can the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit in one be destroyed? That's because you think that you can lose your salvation. Further details on eternal life as an intrinsic part of the believer is here. Now we get to 3.16 of John. 